welcome to Blessing from my hometown in Zimbabwe. I see we have some uh, people from Prague, welcome. Palestine, Lebanon, and Gaza. Okay, so my presentation is about uh, the concept of uh, system administration with this space. This may be a new concept to, to most of you. I don't know what role you play uh, with institutional repositories, um, but um, in my opinion, a, a, a successful repository uh, is built and maintained by a good system administrator. Okay, so uh, let's start with the first slide. Okay, um, there is some confusion uh, when I talk to people about technical support for uh, DSpace, uh, the difference between a system administrator and a, a web programmer. Basically, a system administrator looks after the hardware component, while a web programmer looks after the software component of, of the system. Um, and also, just to keep in mind, that due to the rapid expansion and adoption of technology, it is really no longer feasible to employ what we call a full stack IT guy, an IT guy that can do everything, an IT guy that can do web programming, that understands um, Microsoft servers, that understands Linux servers, that understands system administration on Linux systems, that understands system administration on Microsoft systems. The technology, uh, it's just too much technology now. Um, so it is um, becoming more and more um, the standard practice now is to, to hire specialized people on the web to do specialized tasks. So for the, for the sake of this presentation in DSpace, system administration is the hardware side and networking side, and the web programming side is the theme, the code of the DSpace software, uh, and, and uh, modify that. And that is not easy class. The code in the DSpace software employs a lot of uh, programming languages. And again, it would be very difficult to find a guy who knows all those programming stacks and knows all the system administrator. Okay. So there, um, there's, that's why there's more of a clear definition now between hardware and software support. And in the IT world, this is called DevOps, where the development people integrate with the operational people. So it's the integration between the hardware stack and the software stack. So here at Stellenbosch, I look after the, the hardware stack uh, of the um, system. We don't yet have uh, somebody to look after the uh, software stack. In other words, customizing the DSpace software, um, finding and fixing bugs in the DSpace software. We don't, have, we don't have somebody that is like that yet. But it, I believe that we are um, planning to employ somebody like that because uh, it's only fair that since we use the free DSpace software that we should contribute back some kind of code or bug fixing capability to the community. Uh, my contribution to the community is these webinars and uh, the wiki that I develop and try to maintain. Okay, so hopefully you understand as we continue further that I'm talking specifically about the hardware stack when we're talking about system administration. The web stack and the software stack, that is another issue entirely. Okay. Next slide. Another way to try to explain the difference um, that I've tried to put it up on, on, on the wiki is, um, is to use the analogy of property, developer, property development. Um, you have this, uh, you buy a plot of land uh, and so people go in there and, and build roads and put in uh, the reticulation for um, uh, electricity and water and the internet. And so um, then people come along and they erect buildings on the land and then people come along and occupy the buildings with furniture and, and, and do things. Now in the, in the system administration world, the equivalent is um, going in there, preparing the land, uh, putting in the uh, network, the heart, the, uh, for example, like the lights and water, um, and make it ready for occupation. Then in the web programming world, that would be the people uh, occupying the buildings with um, furniture, whatever, and beginning their uh, business. Uh, so that that's kind of gives you an analogy um, between uh, the difference between um, hardware system administration and um, 
uh, the, 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 the soft part, uh, the programming administration. So there I have in the second sentence that, you know, the technical team prepares the roads and utilities by constructing data center which houses the networking and server equipment. Then the technical team erects buildings by installing software on the servers. The software on the servers is then used by the operational team, the equivalent of businesses or residents to complete the function. So the, the, uh, what I'm trying to emphasize is that there's a clear difference between the hardware component and the software component of, of managing the DSpace system. Okay, next thing. So what is the, what is the definition of system administration? Um, I will, I'm going to refer to Wikipedia uh, because it's just so convenient and, and available. So according to Wikipedia, uh, a system administrator or a sysadmin is a person who is responsible for the upkeep, configuration and reliable operation of computer systems, especially multi-user computers such as servers. So that's in a nutshell. I look after the servers and the networking. and. Uh, the software and the, the other stuff, the code, the source code, the maintenance of source code is another uh, um, function entirely. And then I have some um, links there uh, for you to go and have a look at as well as the definitions of system administrator. And again, I just want to, can't stress it enough that a system program, system administrator is not a programmer. I'm definitely not a programmer, not even a C++, C programmer, I, I do, uh, the most of you in programming is uh, writing shell scripts to automate stuff on, on, on the servers. Uh, and um, I look at the code obviously, but I'm not a, an expert on the code. I might be able to debug some simple stuff in code, but I'm not a professional programmer. Not a web programmer, or nor, nor a C++ or any kind of programming like that. Okay. So, what core skills should a programmer, system administrator have for um, administrating uh, a DSpace uh, system? Or, um, if you're going to hire a system administrator, you would like to make the best use of this person. So, you probably want to develop more open systems. So, to make your system administrator um, very, very useful, it's ideal that the uh, system administrator have these core skills. Uh, at least expert with an Ubuntu Linux server operating system. Um, the server operating system is where all the code and stuff runs. And then expert with a dog, Tomcat Java web app. Now that is the critical component of DSpace that um, actually runs the DSpace application, the Tomcat Java web app. So the system is really should be pretty well versed with how to um, set that Tomcat Java web app server up. Then there's the LAMP stack. Um, if you're not familiar with the acronym, that stands for uh, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Those four components together form the LAMP stack. And the LAMP stack, for example, is what you use for running WordPress websites, for example. So if the system administrator is familiar with the LAMP stack, then you've got a whole world of open source web apps at your disposal that run on the LAMP stack. You can do open journal systems, you can now do open conference systems, you can do uh, open monograph systems, any system that's a LAMP stack and open source, you can do it. Uh, you can do view find, uh, you can do Vivo. I don't know if Vivo is a LAMP stack, but I think uh, view find is a LAMP stack. Then um, the system administrator must be expert with virtualization and cloud services. Um, this is a big one. Uh, it's coming in, in, in later years. Uh, virtualization um, with uh, VMware and VirtualBox and, and in the Linux world now uh, with containerization, LXD containers, LXC containers now which is the latest and greatest uh, flavor of virtualization. And then in cloud services um, it would be very helpful if the system administrators are uh, happy to do um, to spin up uh, servers in the cloud say with um, I don't want to mention names of cloud service providers that might get into trouble, but there's, uh, of course, you know, there's some big ones. And then there's some small local ones. So uh, a system administrator is familiar with uh, administrating cloud servers. Very, very handy person. And then um, the system administrator must have some bash. Um, 
Bash being an acronym for the Born Again Shell, and um, it's a very old piece of software. Uh, if, if you're uh, in the IT world, you realize that now um, Windows 10 is now going to have the Bash shell in it, uh, the, Ubuntu ba the Ubuntu version of the Bash shell. Uh, very exciting news that um, uh, Microsoft is beginning to see the light about open source software and the stability and security of it. So Windows 10 will have a Bash shell. Okay. So uh, at, at the least, your system administrator should have a lot of Bash programming skills. Another very uh, important core skill for a system administrator is to have uh, networking skills. In the beginning, um, uh, there was uh, several kind of uh, competing protocols uh, for internetworking. There was NetWare, there was Banyan environment. Um, but they were all proprietary and they eventually died and the, uh, the winner that eventually came out of the uh, network, inter-networking wars is what we call the TCP forward slash IP stack. And TCP is an acronym for the Transmission Control uh, Protocol and IP is an acronym for internetting inter-networking protocol. So, it is critical um, that a system administrator at least understands that networking stack and all the protocols and how they work and uh, even understands how to wire up um, things physically through routers and switches and etc. Um, so uh, not necessary for uh, a system administrator to know the old networking protocols but definitely the, um, the winner of the TCP IP um, networking stack. Also, the, you would like to make sure that your system administrator is familiar with how to set up server hardware when it arrives out of the box. Uh, and things to know is how to optimize the server with, say, for example, um, RAID arrays or for disk usage, how to set up a RAID array, or on a very large system, how to set up a logical volume manager, and how to set up uh, and use the uh, big file systems, ZFS and uh, XFS. On the, on, on the server hardware. And then uh, again, um, also very handy um, if your system administrator has a, a good understanding of networking hardware, for example from HP or Huawei or Cisco, and has an understanding of how to set up those routers and how they, um, they work. And also very handy if the your system administrator understands the, uh, firewalls, uh, etc. Okay, so those are core skills. I'm just going to go through to the next slide. Now, what kind of specialist skills a system administrator? Well, obviously, for um, the purposes of this presentation, it would be great if a uh, system administrator worked with installing and configuring the technical aspects of DSpace um, and has, uh, has some experience with that. Also, um, the uh, the number two in the world for uh, repository software is ePrints, so uh, if you're thinking of uh, also supporting those, some of the, that software for some repository infrastructure, great, if there's a system administrator has some experience with that. I did an ePrints installation, I think, uh, about five, six years ago. Um, very nice system, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say anything about that. But uh, it would be very nice if your system administrator has some of those skills and experience with eSprint. The next one is PKP. Uh, if you don't know, uh, PKP is the Public Knowledge Project. It's the people uh, building and maintaining the source code for uh, open journal systems, open conference systems, open monograph systems, and open harvester systems. So again, if your system administrator has some experience with that, it would be a great uh, value added um, asset. Uh, again, in, uh, in open data, I know this is a new and recent thing, but it would be great if the system administrator has some experience with open data, especially uh, the file systems and using open data, Ceph, uh, those big distributed file systems, Ceph, uh, and then I think uh, there is the, uh, the big uh, unstructured databases, I think that's MongoDB, and then there's a talk of the Hadoop, uh, etc. So, it would be great to have some of those skills, or at least know um, of the technologies uh, to be used in open data. And then um, the person who has those uh, skills is then more than ready to help you uh, set up uh, 
up an educational resources platform, um, depending on what, how you want to do it, using wikis, using a, uh, a learning management system like Moodle or something like that, they're more than capable then of supporting the infrastructure for something like that. So uh, I just want to go to the previous slide. So there we have the core skills and then we have the special skills. Now, once you have this person, then you have some really good uh, options for um, developing and uh, deploying uh, open, source, um, open source web applications. Plenty of uh, opportunity and scope there for uh, really blowing people's minds apart with what can be done. Okay. Now, if these people are so handy, where do we find them? Well, a good start is to uh, look around at the um, your technology universities that you have locally um, in your region. Um, ideally, the candidates for um, my side of the, of the equation, of the hardware side of the equation, is people that have studied information technology. And those who do um, the web programming side and maintenance of the software are computer science. And generally anybody who's got some experience with electronics, especially in the last five years, that's a good candidate. And anybody who's specialized in open software system support is also a good candidate. It's self-taught in that. Okay, and then just an example, in South Africa I've given some links to the particular departments where you possibly find these people um, and what they are trained in. So if you advertise, these are the people, this is the place to probably look, or, or, or the type of people with the type of qualification you want, these are the type of people that you want. Okay, so that's how you find one in the next slide. Okay, so what are the regular, what is a, what does a system administrator do um, on a daily basis? Well, I check the server backups. It was very critical for the disaster recovery to have healthy backups and to do regular backups. Uh, in the morning I come in and I check on all my servers and make sure that they are working, that there's no disk usage problems, there's no outage problems, no um, virtual machine problems, etc. And then also um, I make sure the network is, is working well, the routers are working well, there's no congestion, there's no bottleneck here anywhere, uh, there's no failure of any devices and anything. And then I perform critical software updates, security updates on a daily basis, uh, monitoring the servers and make sure that they're secure and uh, keeping things uh, healthy and uh, robust as our um, university vice chancellor would call it, the system is robust. So that's my task to make sure that my DSpace and open journal systems and, and, and uh, journals and everything, the infrastructure that it runs on is robust and healthy. Okay, next slide. Now specifically, uh, what kind of system administration does DSpace require? Well, Obviously, the first step in the uh, system administration of DSpace is to build the application and install DSpace. That is a very important task, um, and I've done uh, some videos on that. And I have some particular best practices of system administration to do there. Uh, as I said earlier in those videos, um, it's not uh, widely recognized in the DSpace development community. So, hopefully, as the videos and this presentation. Um, are more visible and create more impact, that there is um, a better understanding of why I use those best practices. So, a very important part for the system administrators to build and install DSpace. Then the second part, um, which we're going to deal with later in some uh, follow-up webinars, is the customization of DSpace. And I'm expressing not the programming, there's plenty of technical customization of DSpace to do, for example, all the indexes, uh, the theme, uh, setting up the theme, uh, um, not programming it, but designing it uh, of the theme, um, setting up the handle server, setting up secure connections, there's plenty of that and I have, I've begun to start some videos for, that, um, for those tasks. Um, then um, the third thing is you want to um, uh, set up a monitoring system to monitor your server hardware so that you can log in in the morning and you know, just check everything at a glance and I've set it up and I've, I've done a video of how to do that. 
And also you want to monitor the network quite a bit. Um, the firewall that the servers are uh, uh, probably uh, running through uh, in many of the, uh, you want to make sure the secure connections are working, the, net, the local server firewall is okay, and so on. And check the logs for any uh, strange activity on the server. Uh, okay, and then um, number four, very important, is to make sure that um, your system administrator backs up your DSpace using the um, best system administration practice. And in a nutshell, um, what that means is that there should be at least two backups in two different physical locations. Uh, that's the best uh, system administration backup. And so I've done some videos on that as well, on how to ensure that you um, have uh, have good backups, and good and reliable backups. And then uh, a really good system administrator will uh, test uh, his disaster recovery system and try and restore data and so forth. For so far, I haven't uh, had that uh, that uh, joy to do yet. Um, but I have restored some uh, previous problems with uh, this space that uh, went wrong. Um, that um, operational people did wrong, so restoring the database, etc. So, um, for peace of mind, I think a system administrator, uh, for peace of mind of long term sustainability of the system and creating trustworthy, in other words, what I mean by trustworthy, that it's always available, I think hiring or using a professional system administrator it will definitely go a long way towards achieving that for your system. Okay, so I think the most important task after all the building and uh, installing of all the systems and monitoring all the systems is uh, to have the system administrator be prepared for disaster recovery. Um, I suppose that is the most important task that I'm assigned. Uh, as my uh, media supervisor said uh, to the library director, what does your team do? He makes sure everything's safe. Um, so that you don't want to worry about it. Infrastructure shouldn't um, uh, shouldn't uh, be a thing that you keep fixing every day because then you have a, a bad system administrator. So infrastructure should be invisible, should just work. And also this should be an invisible and critical task of the system administrator. This should just work. A system administrator should know how to set up a disaster recovery system and be able to return systems to uh, normal operating uh, to normal operating state as soon as possible after a uh, disaster. So, to formalize this, I would like to introduce you to disaster recovery and give it a definition according to Wikipedia. Disaster recovery involves a set of policies and procedures to enable the recovery or continuation of vital technology infrastructure and systems following a natural or human-induced disaster. And there, I'm pointing to the uh, Wikipedia page for disaster recovery, and then there are some the second link has some very clear instructions on how to set up uh, your own disaster recovery system at your institution. Uh, just as an anecdote, I don't want to mention institutions or names, um, but in the African context, systems were built by one individual over several months. This individual left, and then after a while, the system died, and all the digital assets were lost. So this is not the way to approach uh, setting up an institutional repository. Please try and approach it holistically and make sure that you have disaster recovery in place, a long-term sustainable uh, plan of what you gain, what kind of resources you're going to allocate to the system to make sure that it's sustainable in the long term on the technical side and sustainable in the long term on the operational side. But this is my biggest contribution, uh, is to make sure that uh, is, 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 let's say, a technological insurance through um, uh, disaster recovery. Okay, uh, the next slide. Okay, so what does the, the essential infrastructure look like for um, the important task of disaster recovery? Right? So for every production machine, as you see in the diagram here, for every production machine, I pull a backup into two machines in two different buildings. So and here at Stonewall University I have a backup machine, backup one, in the uh, central IT disaster recovery room. We call it the DR room. 
uh, and there I have a, a, a machine with I think 20 terabytes and I pull in backups from um, Sun Scholar, our production institution repository, and I pull in backups from all the um, uh, journals that we are hosting and all the other servers like our um, Easy Proxy server, my uh, Linux web server, etc. And then backup two is actually a machine that is here in um, our main library building. Um, and that is also about a 20 terabyte machine. And I also, there yeah, I also pull in backup so that if one of the production machines go down, I can recover from one of the backups. If one of the backups go down, I can recover from the other backup or from a production machine. So that is at a minimum is the essential um, infrastructure for disaster recovery. Okay, next slide. All right, then how, how did I implement this disaster recovery system? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, the first uh, thing is I made sure that each backup server is in a different building. I also made sure that each building is, is, is separated so that if there's a fire, the building doesn't jump from one building to another. These buildings are completely separate on campus. So my two backup servers are at least um, five, four kilometers apart on buildings on this campus. Uh, I also made sure that each backup server uses uh, the Ubuntu LTS uh, server operating software uh, for reasons of uh, stability and security. And then each backup server, I have backup, the backup PC uh, software installed and I use that for the backups. I pull the backup from each production server onto each backup server using that software. And the backup PC software uses what we call the rsync method uh, for pulling in backups from the production server. And there's a link there at the bottom for more details on how I set that up. So this is essential um, task for system administrator. It's not only building and installing these space, but making sure these space is backed up all, all, and all the other production uh, servers that the system administrator has set up. So that in a nutshell is a, 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 a workflow or procedure for setting up the Zosso Cover. So you can have a look at whether you have the resources uh, and skills and personnel to do this. Okay, next slide. And then once you've done the, um, the server, you've, you've set up the backup servers, then the name is to make sure on each production server is to set up a local daily backup uh, script that does a local daily backup. Now the local daily backup script uh, exports the database, um, creates a listing of the installed software, backs up the configuration settings for the server. So the server goes down, I've got all the configuration settings for that production server. I've got the database from that production server and I have the installed software for that server. The second thing um, is you on the, on the production server that to be backed up is to enable that production server to be backed up to the remote server. So there's a little procedure there uh, and I try to make sure that's secure that only the uh, backup server is allowed to attach to the production server through a particular port to be able to extract the data from the production server. So um, again, those skills uh, that are that, uh, that enable a system administrator to do this are very important. Okay. So the next slide. As I said earlier on, um, the client configurations, the first step is to create a backup script on each server to be backed up. And the particulars of that script are in, the, uh, in that link there. Uh, as I said earlier, it backs up the database, backs up the install software, backs up actually also the root account backs up the home, uh, if it's DSpace, backs up the home folder where all the assets and uh, the application is. And that is why I was very adamant with the installation of DSpace earlier on why we use a home folder and a home partition. It makes the backups and administration of DSpace a lot simpler. Okay, the next slide. And again, the second thing with the client configurations, I said we use the rsync config me method. And to enable the rsync config method uh, is those links there. Um, I don't want to give out too many details on how this is done because that's a security risk for me. I like to think that uh, this method uh, is, uh, that I use uh, can, um, is uh, protected by what we call security by obscurity. 
Uh, so I don't really want to go into too much details. Please go to the, uh, the link there and have a look for yourself how that's done. Okay, on the server side, the two backup servers, uh, as I said earlier, we installed uh, backup PC. And very important, uh, we define firewalls on uh, those servers, on the servers to be backed up to make sure that only the uh, two backup servers can connect and uh, extra uh, extract and pull down the data that's required from those servers. And uh, again, uh, I suggest please go to the website. I don't want to give away too many details uh, publicly, um, but there's details there on how to um, add servers to what, what, what to the backup PC um, system I set up. And please check uh, my YouTube videos. I uh, have some details on there how to do that. Okay, that's very briefly, and I see we have a bit of time left over, but that's briefly what uh, happens as a system administrator. Um, and I think a good system administrator is a great asset to an open scholarly communications team. And I'm not talking about just um, a green, a green uh, open access repository. I'm talking about gold open access journal systems. I'm talking about open data systems. Uh, and eventually, uh, hopefully, a total open science system where you have open data, open educational resources, and open access. And um, to get the, the a full, what I, to get the two members of a full technical stack, in other words, the hardware stack and software stack, I've added them there in the capacity building. Uh, capacity building also talks about uh, capacity for. Um, hiring people to do operational support, in other words, um, the librarians who do the information um, management on the system. I've also got some uh, details there. So that's, uh, that's it. Thanks very much. No, I'm ready to, to take questions now. I see there's quite a few questions, but I'll, I'll let you manage the questions. And just tell me which ones to answer. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Hilton. Uh, so Mahmoud had a question. Uh, but I think it's already been answered, sir. I don't know, Hilton, if you want to add something. Um, uh, what was the question? So he the was question? asking... Uh, uh, how can we import data from different sources? Yes, and then he clarified that... Um, oh, nice okay. So it's... Oracle yeah, or uh, import... Yeah, um, who's it? Mohammed. Yes, you can. Uh, you can import data if, if you're um, if you're thinking of migrating um, from another system. Uh, if that's what you're talking about, um, I've tried to document in an informal way uh, a way to say um, migrate from uh, what is that one? Eprints. Uh, content DM and other systems. I can't remember where I put those links, but um, there are people are beginning to develop uh, scripts and softwares to do that migration. But as Nathan says, there you can export the data and import the data via different DSpace systems using uh, standardized uh, archive formats or, or uh, I don't know how to say it, um, procedures. Um, and and uh, this is the, um, hopefully there will be, in, in the future, there will be a standard uh, way of um, importing and exporting um, content between repository systems, no matter what type of uh, software you use. There is a protocol called the OIA-PMH protocol or OIA-ORE protocol, which allows you to import and export data between repository systems. But it, that means that all the repository systems that should that should then uh, apply that standard, or else alternatively use uh, hopefully an open export format that then can be uh, openly imported. Okay, uh, I see. Then is there another question? Yes, there is a question. Okay, Nathan mentioned. Oh uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, which is going to read a question from Umar, uh, which had very specification should the backup PC one and two have? 
<laughs> oh, okay. Um, Umar. Um, all right. Um, if you look at it logically, the backup PC is not going to. You don't need it to have a large compute CPU component. It's not going to do a lot of any computing. Um, it's not going to do a lot of networking. It's going to do networking at night um, when it's uh, quiet. That's when it should pull in all the backups at night, so late at night, say like between two and four o'clock in the morning. So the real interesting component of the servers is um, the disk space. Um, so the um, the server in our central IT room, I think, is a Dell R550 or something like that. And so we have 20 terabytes of this space available there that I've um, um, uh, formatted or built on top of a RAID 6 array. And then in our, um, in our um, uh, library, in our library network room, our main library network room, I have a super micro. That's right, I have a super micro system. Also with about 20 terabytes of disk space. Um, if I can get the invoices or something like that, I'll try and make them available to Erna later on. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? There is a question from David, sir. Can you speak a bit about the Dura Space Development Project's uh, request copy? It's it sensible to deviate too far from the general re release specifications. We like the idea of cover sheets and other functionality. So Hilton and Nathan, would you like to answer this? Um, Nathan, do you want to answer or should I answer? Mason, are you going to answer? Okay, I just want to say something about that. Um, specifically, the request, um, later on there's going to be a presentation on customization and I was going to briefly um, go over the many customization tasks. One of them is the request copy. And according to um, our founding fathers of the open access movement, uh, uh, Stephen Honard and Peter Suba, the request to copy feature is an essential uh, feature should be an essential feature of the repository. So that, David, should definitely be done. The other features, um, I think the best practice would be to enable them on your development server, all right? Um, then get your operational team, um, in other words, this is not the technical team, this is actual the people who are going to manage the content in the repository. Get them onto your development server and t get them to test all the features as far as they can. Also um, try and enable as many of the features as possible on development server and see how it goes. There are some features that we have enabled and then um, found that there's problems and have uh, subsequently disabled them. Um, particularly the one that I want to make note of is the ORCID feature. We tried desperately to implement this. Um, but we found some bugs in there, and so we've uh, submitted bug reports to the uh, DSpace community, development developer community. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the developer resources. As I said earlier in the presentation, um, I'm a system administrator on the hardware side, not the software side. Um, for that, we need a web programmer, but that's in the works. So, um, no, we, we tried Orca, and um, uh, that, that didn't work. We also tried uh, the cover sheets, as you mentioned earlier. But the cover sheets uh, application did something strange with the bundle management when you do the item view. So um, that one has been disabled. And again, I've put in a bug report for that. Um, basically, I think um, if you want a, if, if, if your strategy is to, to keep the system stable, um, try not to, um, to, to deviate too far from the general release. Um, and also, if you don't have the ideal team. In other words, if you don't have a technical administrator and you don't have a software administrator, then definitely try not to um, uh, try not to put in too many bells and whistles and, and, and to to do too much customization. 
that's just a, uh, a common sense, uh, you know, rational thing. It's not to try and, um, and, as you say, deviate too far if you don't have the resources to manage. If you have the resources to manage it and to fix bugs, etc., then sure, go for it. Uh, I see Umar is um, asking um, customization, which interface is better? Um, is it the um, JSP user interface or XML user interface? Well, that depends, uh, Mark, um, whether you have, as I said, if you've got web programming resources. Um, the JSP user interfaces, uh, which uh, I haven't customized yet, but what I, uh, I can see from the documentation, uh, seems to be simpler to customize when it comes to theming, but difficult to customize when it comes to, to features. Um, whereas the XML user interface um, is both difficult to customize for the, uh, for the theme, and um, I've got plenty of documentation on how to, to set up the features. Now the XML user interface uses the latest web uh, theming technology, the bootstrap theme and uh, cascading style sheets, etc. So it, it's kind of um, a base, well that's what I can only say, base web programming, web, the latest web programming stands. I don't know about the JSP user interface. Uh, thanks very much. That's the, that's the end of my answer there. Thanks. Uh, um. Thank you, Hilton. Do you have any other questions, sir, to Hilton? And in the meantime, I'm typing uh, information about our next webinars. So next uh, Wednesday, we'll have a webinar on adding a responsive user interface to the space repository so it's about enabling and building uh, Mirage team and um, that's a registration URL participation URL I will also add in a minute so it's uh, same time uh, on May 4 and then uh, I think it's 11th of May when we'll have a webinar about the space customization. So I don't know if you don't have any other questions. And thanks again, Hilton. Uh, I'll share Hilton's slides with everybody uh, within an hour or so. And um, I hope uh, to see those of you who are interested uh, next week. Thank you very much and uh, have a very good day. Bye.